So our situation is desperate. Desperate is the word that is most appropriate here. We have an unprecedented crisis and we have still a lack of sufficient awareness of how unprecedented the crisis is. In other words, part of the desperateness resides precisely in the desperateness of the situation not being recognized. This is what I call the meta-emergency. The climate, more than emergency, is redoubled as an emergency precisely in that it isn't really recognized by almost anybody as an emergency. So how to respond to a situation as desperate as this? We must respond to it in truth. We must respond to it in its full measure. And just because it's so desperate and extreme and we're liable to get desperate about it, we have at the same time to try to preserve our own dignity and civility and what is slightly misle misleadingly called our humanity through it all. And why do I say this? Well, I say it because it's true, but I also say it because we're at the start of a debate here where there's going to be some disagreements. And I think it's really important that we try to maintain those qualities through that debate. My teacher, Joanna Macy, was asked by an interviewer a few years ago, Joanna, you're in your 90s now. You're a lot more pessimistic than you were in your 60s or 70s. Why do you even carry on now? You could just sort of retire. And she replied, I carry on because as this gets worse, I don't want you to turn on each other. I don't want my students, my children, the people I respect and love to turn on each other. So in 2019, the radical flank, Extinction Rebellion, the school strikes, etc., achieved something remarkable. And I think we should, we should acknowledge that fully. A partial mainstreaming of climate concern. It had never happened before. There was then a plateau, and what many of us concluded is you can't just carry on doing the same thing over and over again. So what now? So the logical thing might seem to be to go further, to escalate. That is what the Roger Hallam movement, inspired movements of Insulate Britain and Just Stop Oil have done. That is what Andreas is recommending us to go even further in doing. So should we do that? It seems to be the most natural thing to do. What about considering something really surprising, doing the opposite? As I see it, the window has been opened, a, punch, a hole has been punched in the pre-existing consensus by the radical flank. What we need to do is we need to lead masses of people through it, while at the same time deepening our truth-telling to wake up more still. So I'm agreeing, by the way, you'll have noticed there that leadership is called for. But Leninism? If eco-Leninism means a vanguard that wins without waking up many, many more people more and bringing them on board into action, then it is impossible. It is a contradiction in terms. Because what is so unique about this crisis is the extraordinary extent to which it is one that saturates our whole lives. The climate more than emergency is quotidian every day. There is no non-democratic solution to it, and thus, incidentally, the deep importance of upgrading democracy. Or put it another way, if it were possible to tackle this crisis without consent, it would be so only at the cost of an entirely dystopian police state, which would make Stalin blush. Moreover, I see no appetite yet for eco-Leninism anyway, no constituency for it of more than a minuscule size. Whereas the new mass, truth-based, moderate flank that is emerging has, I think, huge potential. What I mean in talking about this new moderate flank is something that will mainstream action, not just activism. One of the main barriers to entry into the climate movement is the requirement that one be an activist. That very self-identity puts off most people to begin with. So what I'm thinking about is things like professions organizing themselves, lawyers, advertising execs, fiduciaries. 
I'm thinking about communities organizing themselves to adapt as well as to mitigate. And that's what I think could conceivably work, a mass moderate flank to complement, to take advantage of the partial success that the radical flank has had. Deliberately non-polarizing, deliberately inclusive in ways that don't always make us, by us I mean something like the people in this room, comfortable. Largely a bottom-up phenomenon, distributed. Because it's really important to be clear that there is a ceiling to what the radical flank can achieve. We saw some of that ceiling towards the end of 2019. And we're seeing it again now. The radical flank polarizes, that's what it does. It will probably never feel inclusive to most people. It cannot complete the mainstreaming job it began. And in a society where the possibility of achieving the kind of climate action we need by consent is being ruined by polarization, we have to look to a way forward which will be unpolarizing. So either you believe we can just bypass the mainstream, some version of eco-Leninism as Andreas and presumably Zizek favor, or you must consider the possibility of a way of completing the mainstreaming job that the radical flank began. And that is what I am proposing, a mass moderate flank made possible by the groundbreaking that the radical flank has achieved since 2019. I believe it's probably our best hope. And the last thing I'd like to say before we moved into the debate proper is that the best compliment that we can pay to the success, the partial success that the radical flank has had is precisely to build such a new mass moderate flank.